All right, good morning, boys. Good morning, girls. Welcome to your class. And today we are going to go into a very relevant part of our syllabus. And I hope before that everybody is in good health. I am not too, too much in good health myself. So I have a bit of a cough and cold. So there will be a bit of an issue. And I don't know if I can continue for 9.30 to 10.30 to 11.10. Maybe 10.30 we will call it off. We will go into just the gist of it. And I will try to explain this part of the subject matter as best as I can. And this is a part where you need to understand very, very, very well. There is no issue. The previous parts that I have been talking about were very abstract subjects, all about forces, the stresses and balancing of forces. These are all very abstract. We cannot show you the forces, but we know that they are acting. But now we are, what we are going to do is fuel pump. And the fuel pump, your understanding has to be very, very good. Because ultimately, you will be required to do the work on board the ship regarding setting of the pump, regarding cutting off the pump, overhauling of the pump. These parts, and these pumps are not like ordinary pumps. These pumps are very, very crucial. They are precision engineered pumps, which means the tolerances within them is very, very fine. And in fact, some companies do not allow the shipboard people to handle these pumps. But in our time, we did it. But now I don't know if they are allowing shipboard personnel to actually overhaul these pumps. These pumps are basically mechanical pumps. And ultimately, they will have some amount of electrical connectivity. This electrical connectivity ensures satisfactory operation at all times. And it is a monitoring arrangement where a sensor or a pressure device is continuously sending the signal to the person who is monitoring the entire engine. So he gets the information. So right now we have about 52 cadets right in, you know, I mean only 50 have come in really. And there is a total of 38 plus 38, 76. 76 boys are supposed to come in. And we have been categorically told that do not allow late comers to come into the class. Mark them absent. So I suppose I have to follow out the dictates of our administration. And it's best that you come in time and this is the first class of the day so you cannot give an excuse that i was held up by the other class previous to this class so there is no excuse in coming late and we are told time and again to be a little more strict about everything i i feel more than being strict is getting you interested in the subject if i can generate that interest in you you will automatically become very attentive, very focused, and definitely a good candidate. But by scolding, by giving threats, that's not the way I can generate interest in you. So I will try to generate interest in you through the actual subject matter. On board the ship, you will be dealing with these pumps. And now that we have 54, let us start. And there are some, there you are, moment I try to start, somebody comes into the class. I try to accommodate everybody, even if you're a little late. I know I've also had internet problems earlier and that has delayed me in starting a class. So that is the situation. So let us start with a subject. We were on plate six last. Plate six is say, this one. Or oh, let's go one step behind. Uh, <coughs> Abhijit. So we all know that a normal pump which generates hydraulic pressure ultimately opens that injector. Okay, that is a normal type of jerk pump which sends the pressure to the injector and sets the injector to work. Now what we have next is the second type of jerk pump is the valve control type of pump. The valve control type of pump is largely used in Sulzer engines. In the Sulzer engine, you will not have the Bosch pump. You will have the uh, valve control pump. This valve control pump consists of a main plunger at the center 
main plunger at the center and then we have suction and discharge valves. I think 9.40 we will stop everybody from coming and whoever comes in good enough, if they don't come in in time, we are not going to allow them in. 9.40, 10 minutes is enough time for everybody to come in. More so as this is the first class of the day. So you should be in time. I don't see why you can't be in time. I can be in time. It's sitting in the house and opening the laptop and then finally I'm working on it. Otherwise, what happens? You keep coming late. You're a disturbance to the other students who are actually following the PowerPoint program. Every, every time I have to lower the PowerPoint program and I can again go back to allow the boys in. Okay. So we have two types of pump. One is a Bosch pump and one is a valve control type of pump. The valve control type of pump is largely used in Sulzer engines. I'm sure everybody knows what are Sulzer engines. So these are the two main pumps that we will be dealing with. Okay. A few words about the other item, which is called the common rail system. Something is ringing. What is ringing? Oh, somebody is calling. Oh, Balu. Oh, just a minute, please. Yeah, Balu, I have just started class. I'll give you a call. Oh, okay, okay. So, what I was saying is a, a few words about the common rail system. And ultimately, it will be the common rail system that you will be really focused on in your later years, in your later years of your experience. Most engines are somehow gradually changing over to common rail system. And in fact, all the diesel engines which are in your automobiles, they are all common rail engines. Now, who is this fellow who has come now? Karu Tharan Ashwin, a Sanjeev. There's another fellow, Gorai. I think these will be the last guys we will admit. You can't keep coming late there. Yeah. It's a disturbance with the whole class. Okay, we are not allowing any more boys coming in. We've got 62 boys, which means actually 60. So 18 boys are absent. It is gone on record because I have already put it on record. You can't keep coming late. And we are time and again told by the administration, no, I will not admit him. There's uh, time and again we are told, I will deny his entry first. Deny entry. Kumar Gaurav denied. See, unless I take action, you fellows don't respond. Why is it that only a punishment gets you to deliver the goods? In other words, do what you are required to do. No, I will deny him an entry. Denied. Kumar Gaurav. No. no, I will not bother him. Otherwise, it's a disturbance. Why is it? that unless punishment is given to you, you will not do what is required of you. It's very sad, very sad. Unless you are punished, you will not do it. Very, very, very sad. A very sad way of approaching anything. Class in charges, who are the class in charges? Pratham, C and D. <clears throat> Pratham Joshi and Kundan Kumar, Paran Abdus and Prashant Mishra. Please, instruct the boys to come in time. At the most, I can give five minutes for you to be delayed. But beyond that, it becomes a disturbance for everybody else. So make sure that you instruct all the boys to come at least five minutes. I'm giving five minutes of your time. Normally, if I'm called for a, a webinar, I'm 15 minutes earlier. I just keep the thing on and I'm ready. Moment it starts, I'm there. So that sort of a thing. You have to be a little better disciplined in this kind of situation. So anyway, let us proceed. I am not allowing any more boys to come in. In, in future, it will be only five minutes. I will, if it is 9.30 up to 9.35, I will allow students to come in. Beyond that, sorry, you can hear the lecture out on your own and then do what you feel like. So I was explaining the common rail system. Here, a single engine operated pump delivers fuel to a common pipe or manifold, which is called common rail. Separate high pressure pipes are led to individually controlled fuel injectors on the cylinder heads. 
Now, this is the diagram which gives you an approximation of what is a common rail system. Here you have one pump. In some cases, you may have more than one pump, maybe two pumps, because if one pump fails, the other one can take over. So this is a positive displacement pump and it is a very high pressure pump. That means it can generate very high pressure. So the fuel is sent into a common pipe or what is called a common rail. And this common rail has a pressure of 1000 bar plus. Some of them have 2000. Even now, as of now, I know there are pipes which are being built at 3000 bar. So 3000 bar is enormous pressure. And that pressure means the pipe has to be very, very robust, very strong. So that pipe is always in a state of high pressure. And from the individual, from the pipe, you have individual pipelines which are going directly into the injector. And that <coughs> injector is controlled, operation of that injector is controlled by a master controller. This master controller is actually giving you servo supply oil of 200 bar, which will operate or send a signal for operating the fuel injector. And all this is computerized. This computerization helps in accuracy. Computerization of the procedure helps in accuracy. I can inject the fuel 5 degrees 20 minutes before TDC. I can inject the fuel 5 minutes 22 degrees before TDC. It gives that level of accuracy. So this is the software which is called VEX 9500 control. VEX stands for Watsila Engine Control System. And this is a software designed by Watsila. If you must know, Watsila and Sulzer, they have joined hands. In fact, New Sulzer Diesel is a new company, but it has been consumed or subsumed by Watsila company. Watsila is from Finland and Sulzer is from Switzerland. So this is the software which is operating your master controller. And then the fuel which comes is coming into, in this particular case, there are three injectors for one cylinder. Now, I, I might as well explain to you why three injectors are used for one cylinder. You see, every fuel injector will operate at a certain efficiency. This efficiency is best when the load is 75% or more. Below this load, a fuel injector does not operate to the required level of efficiency. That means that 20% load, the fuel injector does have atomization and penetration and all that. But it is not as good as what it would do when the load is 75% and more. So that is why instead of having one injector, we have three injectors. So that at part load conditions, only one injector will be operated and it will operate at 75% efficiency. At 75% load, thereby giving very high efficiency of atomization, penetration, they will be in the ideal condition. All right. And when it is on half load, then two injectors will be operating and they will give the best delivery of fuel into the combustion chamber to ensure that the combustion is near perfection. And then again, when you have maximum load on the engine, then all three injectors will be working. And the operation of all three injectors are automatic. In other words, you don't have to inter intercede. Okay, automatic meaning the, the software that is there, it will sense what is the load of the engine and accordingly give signal for the operation of one, two or three injectors. That is what it is. Okay, next part is what we have is uh, how the pressure is developed. The pressure is developed by means of a fuel pump. And this pump is actually engine directly engine driven. You can see the connecting rod driving the crankshaft and from the crankshaft uh, output drive has been taken to run a pump and this pump is running through a trilobe cam there was a very interesting question a boy asked me from section uh, i think e and e or f i think from f and uh, he asked me sir why is there a trilobe cam to operate the pump so for a moment, I did not have the answer, but then I went and found out the answer that the genuine reason is, you see, one thing you must, in case for normal cam, 
uh, first you must understand the normal camp. The normal camp, which is something like, you know, like this, what you see here. This is the normal camp. All right. So this normal camp, when it is rotating to lift the plunger upward, there is a certain amount of acceleration that is denoted, given to that plunger assembly. That means the plunger, the spring carrier, the spring, and whatever parts are attached which move. So this acceleration force and the mass involved is repeatedly affecting the force apart from the pressure that is being built up to pump the oil into the common rail. Now these forces are enormous. With a single cam, the distance that the plunger has to travel is much more. All right. The plunger has to travel much more with the single cam. Now, <clears throat> this causes enormous pressure between the roller and the cam. If you see two round bodies, when they make contact with each other, the area of contact is only a thin line. You see, if you take two circular bodies, the roller and the cam, when they touch each other, the, touch, the contact face is just one thin line. But the pressure or the, the, the force is enormous. It has to overcome 1000 bar pressure. And then it also has to take care of the acceleration that it has caused in raising the piston till it reaches TDC. Once it reaches TDC, then the acceleration stops. This continued repeated acceleration causes enormous amount of force between the roller and the cam. Ensuring lubrication between the roller and the cam is another very difficult proposition. So to overcome this problem, we have an arrangement where we have a trilobe cam. You see, in the trilobe cam, the stroke is definitely much smaller. And for each revolution of the cam, the pump is worked three times. All right. So the distance the plunger has to be lifted is much smaller. So the acceleration forces are also much smaller. So ultimately, a trilobe cam is used to minimize the stresses that are involved between the cam and the roller. The stresses are enormous and I have seen one particular engine during my service period, the entire roller was worn out and we were very fortunate that there was no crankcase explosion because ultimately it is not only wearing out, what the color change of that roller indicated a bluish color. If steel becomes bluish in color, it is indication of being overheated and that is one observation you must make when inspecting machinery component because when you inspect the machinery component at that time they are cold that time they don't have any high temperature so you can feel and decide that it is hot because it has already cooled down but there are indications of a component being overheated when it is cold and that is discoloration of the surface you will have a bluish color and there will be a borderline marks at the region where the temperature variation has been there. You need to be a little observant to check for these overheating, overheated component because an overheated component inside the engine is liable to crankcase explosions, very severe crankcase explosions because they become the hot spot. Okay, so this is your common rail system. It is completely computer controlled and not only is the fuel injection controlled by the computer, you also have the exhaust valve control by the computer. So the computer can not only decide when to open the exhaust valve, but also how, what rate it is to be opened and what rate it is to be closed. Ultimately, this very precise control of engine components and engine devices it gives the ideal combustion process and that is our objective to get the maximum out of the fuel that you're paying for and then convert it into work that is the ultimate objective that whatever oil we burn get the maximum and convert it into useful work okay i think this is the the if we use circular cam what will happen circular cam circular cam is what i told you this is a circular cam 
the normal cam that you see and this is a trilobe cam this is a trilobe cam you can see for that every revolution the cam is going to operate that pump three times all right and you see the lift also has been marked by those arrowheads over there and it shows you that uh, what is the distance the pump has to travel now if you have a trilobe cam the pressure against the cam peak will be not as high as the normal cam because over here the pressures are in the region of 1000 plus bar so farhan yeah if you use a circular cam what will happen what is circular cam i don't really get here a cam has a base circle and it has a cam peak that is a normal cam and this here is a trilobe cam the trilobe cam means it has got three different raised peaks on one circular cam base circle so these are what is called your trilobe cam and this is called your normal cam okay what will happen what can happen i don't know what can happen i never heard of a circular cam cam is a cam it has got a base circle and it got a cam peak but circular cam Paran, I am not very sure what you are, what you are, what you are asking. Okay, okay. Now let's go back to the pumps that we will actually be dealing on board the ship. Okay. Now in the jerk system, you have a helix control pump. It is called a helix control pump. The Bosch pump is basically a helix control pump. Though Bosch has been the originator of this pump, there have been many. licensee manufacturers who have redesigned the bosch pump and ultimately they claim their pump is a better one but it is ultimately the same it is the helix or the curved surface which is called the helices that ultimately control the fuel delivery to the fuel pump so let us start with what are the most principal parts of the pump one is a plunger and one is a barrel and uh, they come together they are matched with each other there are no piston rings but they function like a piston and a cylinder so the plunger has no piston rings and they are matched with each other and they come as one set that means if the plunger gets defective you have to change plunger and barrel together if the barrel gets defective you have to again change the barrel and plunger together okay so that is the key part of the whole pump the plunger and the barrel it is piston and cylinder next what we have is the control sleeve i will give you the diagram just now first let's, let's have the terms the names of the parts of the pump reasonably understood so that when you actually describe a pump you will be able to use the correct terms so these are the terms which are required to be used and you must make yourself as familiar as possible okay okay so first is the plunger barrel control sleeve control sleeve is what controls the plunger now you see this plunger which is like a piston it works up and down or reciprocates okay apart from reciprocation of the plunger there is a means to rotate the plunger of course it does not rotate round and round it rotates through a certain angle and back that's all i don't remember how much maybe about 120 degrees of rotation is possible by that plunger about 120 degrees okay so the plunger function is to reciprocate and also rotate the barrel is fixed the barrel is fixed inside the pump housing i have not mentioned a uh, pump housing is at the bottom um, so the plunger rotates by means of the control sleeve now how does the control sleeve rotate to rotate the control sleeve we have a control rack and this control sleeve at the upper region it has got gear teeth this gear teeth is matched with the gear teeth of the control rack so when the control rack moves the control sleeve rotates and when the control sleeve rotates the plunger also rotates of course simultaneously the plunger is moving up and down next what we have is the delivery valve see the moment the pump delivers oil in the upward stroke it should cut off 
That means the oil which is trapped in the pipe right up to the injector must remain in the pipe. It must not come back to the pump and come into the uh, normal line. So we have a non-return delivery valve at the end of the pump plunger so that no oil from the injector starts coming back again. So the oil from the pump to the injector remains entrapped. So that next stroke, the oil that is pushed from here, that oil which is in the pipe will deliver. Otherwise, what will happen? If the, all the oil comes back, there will possibly be gas inside or some amount of air will come in. Because main pipeline has some amount of air also. So it is ensured that no air lock happens after the fuel pump up to the fuel injector. Because we need a solid injection process. Solid injection process means a liquid which is compressed is works like a solid. That's why it is called a solid injection process. A little beeline, the term is a little beeline, but that is what it means. A solid injection process means it is a liquid which is incompressible and therefore it is called a solid injection process. Apart from the delivery valve, we have a spring. Now when the pump plunger goes up, what brings it down? Something has to bring it down again. So you have a spring attached and that brings the plunger down. And the spring rests in a carrier which is fitted to the plunger base and then that helps to bring the whole plunger downwards. Okay, this is one. And number eight, what we have is called a baffle or erosion screw. The, during the injection process, a very high pressure is developed. Okay, 350, 380 bar. So this pressure at the time of end of injection is released into the spill line. It is released into the spill line. But from 380 bar to 0 bar, or not 0 bar, 2 or 3 bar, the flow of oil is going to be very fast. And this flow of oil is so fast that when it comes in between the casing and the, and the barrel, the casing can get worn out. It can be eroded because the pressure of oil is such and if you keep injecting or delivering oil at a very high pressure on a surface, that surface is going to get eroded. Similarly, if you have a jet of water against a wall and for days you put it together, after, after some time you find the wall, the wall has gone eroded. The same thing happens inside the fuel pump. Okay. So that is why a baffle screw is fitted in so that it deflects the oil and puts it in a way which will not have direct impact on the wall of the housing. Okay. And pump housing is what encompasses the entire setup. Okay. Now let's have a read up. The Bosch type of jerk pump is most common in diesel engines for two stroke and four stroke. Individual pumps are fitted for each unit to operate the respective fuel injector. That means one pump, one injector. These pumps are cam operated with single acting plunger. With single acting plunger, that means one plunger is for one pump. Of a fixed stroke, of course, the stroke is fixed. You see, the stroke is dependent on the cam. How much will be the stroke? Again, look at this diagram. This is the cam you see from the base circle to the cam peak. That becomes the stroke of the pump. That means the total distance traveled by the plunger is from the base circle to the cam peak. That is called total stroke of the fuel pump. Okay. Normal helical springs are fitted to return the plunger on its downward stroke and maintain contact with the cam on the camshaft. See, ultimately, once the plunger goes up, it has to be brought down. Once it is brought down, where will it rest? It will go and rest on the base circle of the cam. Okay. And that is always the case. A helix is made, machined on the plunger and delivery of fuel ceases on the upward stroke when the curved edge of the helix uncovers the spill port. Right now, reading this is Greek to you. You will not be able to understand. Moment I show you a diagram and I explain to you, it will become very clear. I wish it was in college where I could actually show you the pump and the plunger 
and could have explained to you how it happens on the pump itself. Now I have nothing else except diagrams to show you, and I have made those diagrams. I will show you this to you in due course. So a helix is machined on the plunger, and delivery of fuel ceases on the upward stroke when the curved edge of the helix uncovers the spill port. Uh, okay, I'm coming to it. Don't get uh, frustrated in understanding what you are saying. This allows fuel pressure above the plunger to fall to the suction pressure through the vertical slot. Okay, now here is the diagram. I'm going to actually increase the size of it and then explain to you what is what. Now, this is a diagram you need to pay full attention to. I'm going to increase this whole thing right up to here. Okay. Now, I hope you can see. Somebody tell me, Farhan, can you see the full diagram? Yes, sir. Farhan, can you see the full diagram? Or are you there or not there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can see. Okay, good. So, now let's start with the left hand side. On the left hand side, what you see the plunger. It looks a little unusual. It doesn't look like a normal straightforward plunger. You see, at the top of the plunger, the top portion, you have that is machined through a milling machine and a groove has been cut, vertical groove. And at the same time, a helical surface has been provided at the little lower region. And this is the space that has been machined out for a normal cylindrical body. So this is the machined out part. And as you see a slot in this side, there is a slot on the other side also. In some pump, you have only one slot. In some pump, you have both two slots. So there is a helical groove on the other side also. Okay. Now this is the top part of the plunger. A little lower, the diameter of the plunger is retained as the bore of the barrel. So this part of the plunger diameter is exactly equal to the diameter of the barrel on the right hand side. So that when this plunger is fitted from underneath, it cannot be fitted from top because it is fitted from underneath. This surface over here, it has got a finished surface matching with the internal surface of the barrel. So that even if you put water in it or oil in it, it will not leak past this particular zone of the barrel. Because the fitting is so good that even water cannot pass through the gap. That is why it is very, very essential to have the plunger and the barrel match with one another. So much so, you cannot change one barrel with another and one plunger with another one and make some sort of a matching arrangement. No, you cannot do that. Each of them comes as a pair and you have to use them as a pair. If it gets defective, the entire pair has to be discarded okay so that is why the plunger and barrel are the key components in the fuel pump much lower down the barrel uh, much lower down the uh, plunger you will see there is a collar this collar is entire is used to rotate the entire plunger to a certain degree i think at about 90 degrees at most maybe a little more i don't really know how many degrees it is rotated but it can be rotated to some extent. And how is it rotated? You see, once the plunger is fitted inside the barrel, and then we have a control sleeve which is going through the entire mask or the entire assembly of the plunger and barrel. And lower down on the control sleeve, you have a slot. This slot goes into the collar space and helps to rotate the plunger. So now if the control sleeve is gone over the barrel and over the plunger and it has allowed that collar to be fitted into that slot. Remember that collar gap is absolutely perfect fit. There is no play between the two. There is no play. It fits right enough. But it is not a rigid or tight fit. It is a sliding fit. Okay, And the slot height is also important to ensure that the plunger is capable of reciprocating up and down without causing any effect on the control sleeve. Okay. So the height of that control sleeve is very important. And that is little more than the stroke of the pump. Okay. Now, how does the control sleeve rotate? 
the control sleeve rotates by the gear teeth which is at the upper region of the control sleeve by means of a rack fuel rack which makes contact with the control sleeve see it is not that at any part of the control sleeve the rack can make contact when you are assembling the pump you see there are two two punch marks on the surface over here or on this part or here somewhere and then those two punch marks are on two of the gear teeth okay on the stub and there is one punch mark i should have made it over here one punch mark on one of the teeth here so when you are actually sliding in the control sleeve into the pump it must be fitted with the fuel rack in position and the two teeth must come in to the space of the one tooth so then it has to match so the two teeth on the control sleeve has to match the one tooth one punch mark on the rack and that is how it is done okay so once that is made then you have the position of the slot with the plunger in a particular position okay so when that rack is pulled to zero this slot over here will be positioned at a certain point now let's have a look at the barrel the barrel is a steel cylinder and at the upper region it has got two holes drilled inside and these two holes are absolutely in line with each other so one is called a suction port and the other one is called a spill port that means oil enters through one and it can go out from the other okay so when the piston when the plunger is at the bdc it is much lower than where the suction and the spill ports are so the oil which is coming into the pump will go in from here and go out from there and then it will go to the mixing tank so there is continuous circulation of oil if the plunger is at bdc okay so the pump remains hot the viscosity of the oil also remains to the required level so that is why it is important to have an arrangement where the fuel oil will continuously circulate within the pump okay so that is the four parts i hope you understand the function of the four principal parts of the pump there are more parts to the pump but these four are the most relevant parts of the fuel pump if you have any questions type it down on the chat column and i will address it okay now the in the fitting condition first thing that you fit in the pump is this barrel you lower the barrel till it rests on this shoulder okay once it rests on the shoulder we are not sure if the radial position is correct or not to ensure that the radial position is correct you have what is called a locating slot this locating slot is a vertical slot it is not i repeat it is not a hole into the barrel it is only a shallow depth slot over here that means if you put something here it is not going to come out from the inside of the barrel it is just a shallow depth machined slot it is not through and through the suction port is through and through and the spill port is through and through but this slot is not through and through it is just maybe 2 3 mm depth as compared to the 15 to 20 mm thickness of the barrel remember the locating slot is not a through and through hole it is only a shallow oval not even oval rectangular oval hole so that the width of that slot is equal to the diameter of the locating screw so when the barrel is placed inside the housing and approximately the position is got and from outside the housing we have a bolt which is fitted through the housing and it goes and lands into the barrel at this point so once that bolt enters that slot it means the barrel has been correctly located in the radial position the bolt is not supposed to go and press into the barrel it is only supposed to go into the slot so that we know that the barrel is located in position correctly it is not expected that the bolt will go and press into the barrel 
these are the finer points of pump assembly what would happen if you made it pushed again then your pump would seize the barrel and the plunger would get seized if you tighten that bolt to a point where it makes contact with the barrel to compress they see what will happen is ultimately all these components are elastic there is some amount of elasticity within them and if you tighten a bolt which presses against the barrel then the circular diameter of the barrel is going to change and that circular diameter inner diameter if it changes it is going to jam that plunger and very soon you will find that plunger has jammed inside be very careful of these finer points okay so let's have a look at the next point oh sorry i have to read what is written here okay let's read up here what he says have you understood are you understanding what i am telling because ultimately if you have not understood my whole purpose is wasted the plunger which works like a piston and has a helix machined at the top section it is this is the top it works like a piston and it has this helix which has machined into the top section with a collar to enable rotation you see there is a collar at the lower region to enable rotation of the plunger the plunger can be rotated by help of that collar the barrel which has a suction and spill port in line that means this is the suction port this is the spill port and they are in line okay with a locating slot this is the locating slot and it helps to locate the barrel absolutely accurately when introduced into the cylinder otherwise it could have been rotated anywhere there is no uh, double pin or anything of the sort locating pin so this locating screw is the one that helps in locating the barrel in the correct purpose wait i am coming to that madhav kumar jha very good i i like your curiosity and your enthusiasm yes good i like it i am coming to it so the barrel which has a suction is put in line with a locating slot a control sleeve with teeth is there to rotate the plunger okay to rotate the plunger the fuel control rack with teeth moved by the governor to rotate the control sleeve ultimately you see this rack it is helping in rotating the control sleeve but then what moves the fuel rack it is the governor so the governor controls the quantity of fuel to be delivered when the pump is working in the vertical direction and ultimately now you must have got some idea that since the governor is going to move the fuel rack it is actually going to rotate the plunger and if you rotate the plunger this helix what you see is going to go once this side or once this side that means it is moving vertically the plunger is moving vertically at the same time the entire plunger is moving to the left or to the right and this in relation to the spill port will determine the quantity of fuel being delivered if the quantity of fuel being delivered is less then the plunger will be rotated in this direction if the quantity of fuel is being uh, more then it will have an arrangement where the height of the helix from the top edge will be maximum let's have a look at the diagram okay now here is the assembled pump let's make it a big one huh? because this explanation is what i will give you where the hell is this oh okay oops sorry Oh, thing off. Okay, my idea is to make it as you know. Okay, I think now you can see better. This is the best shape I can give you. Now you see, this is the pump assembled. Uh, what will be the timing of delivery? Okay, good. I am coming to this. Very good. I like these questions. What is the need for rotating the plunger? Okay. what is the purpose of the helix shape okay and what is the timing of delivery all right now raghav madhav and kartavya pay full attention this is the assembled arrangement of the pump you see the plunger has been introduced into the barrel of course it has been introduced from the bottom and then after the plunger has been introduced 
the the uh, the control sleeve which is this is called the control sleeve is put into the system so that the slot what you see has gone over the collar and now the rack also has made contact with the control sleeve at that point so what happens when i pull the rack in, in the horizontal direction in this direction and in this direction it will mean the control sleeve will rotate and if the control sleeve rotates it means the plunger is going to rotate now at this particular position what you see is the plunger at the bottom dead center the fuel is coming in through the suction port and it is filling up this entire space and it is going out from the spill port it is not only going out from the spill port it is also entering this annular space of the plunger and filling it up with oil okay but it cannot go beyond this port because the diameter of the plunger at this part is absolutely the same as the diameter of the barrel so it is almost liquid tight no liquid can flow in fact no air can also go no air or liquid can go past the plunger at this portion okay so right now what you have you have a situation where the oil is filled up over here oil is filled up over here now assume that the plunger is going to move upwards as it moves upwards what is going to happen some of the oil from there is going to get spilled out because this path is open so the oil will get spilled out and as it keeps getting spilled out the plunger keeps rising and no injection takes place because there is no hydraulic pressure being built up here so as it keeps going up further till such time this top edge of the plunger covers the spill port and the suction port it will cover both of them simultaneously because if you see uh, the both of them are in the same axis both of them are in the same axis so this top edge will cover both of them and then what happens and then the oil on top of the plunger is trapped it cannot go anywhere why because the sides of the plunger over here has blocked this path the sides of this plunger on this side has blocked the spill port so both the ports are blocked and the plunger is at the edge of the ports so the oil on top is trapped and they have nothing to do except get compressed further so as the plunger keeps going up the pressure inside rises and then that hydraulic pressure which is instantaneous in its build up will be delivered to the fuel injector okay so that is how the hydraulic pressure is built up it is trapped inside here now consider the plunger still moving upwards and as it keeps moving upwards 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 as it goes it will be some time before this helical edge will uncover the spill port at this point at the lower point of the spill port moment it uncovers the spill port all the oil pressure from the top will pass to this passage and shoot out from the spill port and that means the pressure on top of the plunger drops to almost suction pressure and fuel injection stops all right so this helix is ultimately controlling the quantity of fuel being delivered and that quantity of fuel being delivered is dependent on the effective stroke of the pump effective stroke if you see is given by these arrowheads over here and these arrowheads are all relative to the spill port and that is why you need to turn the plunger if i were to turn the plunger a little more anti clockwise suppose i turn it anti clockwise till some time the small height arrowhead comes in line with the spill port what would happen it means the oil would be definitely be injected the moment the top edge covers the ports but very soon the edge of the helix would uncover the spill port so very small quantity of fuel would be actually injected all right now if i turn the whole plunger in the clockwise direction in the clockwise direction what would happen i would get a bigger height from the top edge to the lowest point on the helix to continuously deliver that quantity of fuel into the cylinder till such time the plunger in its movement upward will uncover the spill port at the lower edge of the helix that time it is on full load the bigger the effective height more the fuel injected 
that means on full load that will be the position right now what we see of the pump and plunger it is in maximum load or full load okay so raghav what is the need for rotating the plunger you have understood to increase or decrease the quantity of fuel delivered into the combustion chamber we need to rotate the plunger in other words if the load is high we need to give more fuel if the load is low we need to give less fuel and that can be achieved by rotating the plunger movement of the plunger vertically is fixed because it is the cam that is operating the plunger okay the cam will continuously move the plunger a fixed height but rotation of the plunger will decide how much fuel is going to be delivered so from this let's read what he says the bosch jug pump once assembled functions as follows the fuel enters through the suction port and fills the chamber above the plunger okay it comes in from here and fills up it sometimes some of the fuel also goes out to the spill port but that is no relevant uh, reason for com a complaint or worry during the upward stroke the plunger edge covers the suction and spill port to commence delivery under hydraulic pressure okay so when the plunger starts going up the top edge covers the spill port as well as the suction port and then the oil is trapped on top so as it keeps going up then the oil has to go somewhere so the only where place it can go is through to the injector and inject into the combustion chamber okay in continuation of the upward stroke the helical edge uncovers the spill port to release the pressure and end further injection of fuel so as it continues to go up it keeps injecting till such time this helical edge uncovers the spill port moment the spill port is uncovered all the oil pressure here comes to the slot and shoots out from here so this is the part where i was saying the baffle screw is also introduced the baffle screw will be introduced somewhere here and that screw helps to you know streamline the flow in the outward direction as it goes out it will streamline so the baffle screw is something like a bolt which is i'll give you a screw i'll give you a, um, a diagram of how the what the baffle screw looks like You see, this is a baffle screw. All right, the baffle screw is mounted on the housing which is sectioned, and the port from where the oil comes out is this direction. So, what happens when the when the oil comes out? A uh, better. I let me use my camera. I've got it, so I might as well use it. Don't go away. Pay attention to what I'm drawing. Oh, setting. Let us go to video, and then we have a integrated camera. Oh, sorry, yeah, integrated camera. Let's use this one. Okay. Okay. I hope you can see this paper now, but then I think you are seeing it in opposite direction. Let us see. Left. No, this is left for me, and it is right for you. So. Let us uh, I think this is reasonably good, but I need to invert the uh, diagram. I'll again have to do it. Video camera. Okay. Now this is what you see as the baffle screw. Farhan, can you see the diagram? Paran? Yes, sir. Sir, okay. but it is uh, uh, laterally inward. I mean, it is vertical, sir. Can you make it horizontal? It is supposed to be horizontal. What you see is horizontal. This is the horizontal axis, and this is where the spill port is shooting out the oil. 
So as it shoots out the oil, this is the housing. This is part of the housing that I am showing you. And this is the baffle screw. This is the baffle screw. And as the oil shoots out from the suction port, moment the pressure is released, then this oil would have completely eroded the wall that is there. And this shape like a cone helps in the oil flowing streamlined in this direction. So there it does not allow the erosion of the of the wall. This is the wall, what you see, the housing. And the pressure being released from 350 bar to almost 2 to 3 bar, the flow of oil from the suction port is very, very severe. So to divert that oil in a mode that will cause less of erosion, we have what is called the baffle screw. All right. Have you understood? Let's get back to our normal. Ah, I think now you can see it better. Is it better now? Yes, sir. Now it's better. Oh, I had put on one light. Now, see, again I'm explaining. What you see in the section part, it is the wall of the pump. And this is the barrel, what you see. And this is the, suction, the spill port. As the oil comes out from the spill port, first thing it goes and hits the casing, the housing. So to avoid wear down of the housing, you have an arrangement to put a baffle screw. This baffle screw has got a conical end at the tip. So the oil simply flows around the conical and does not have direct impact on the cylinder liner wall, on the housing wall. Okay. That's a small detail, but nevertheless important detail if you are asked a question Okay, now we are back to our normal uh, thing. Let's go back to the diagram. So, have you understood how the pump works and what determines the quantity of fuel injection into the cylinder? Moment the plunger covers the top part of the ports, the oil is trapped on top and then compression of the oil will, uh, uh, brings about hydraulic pressure. This hydraulic pressure causes the injector to open and the pump still keeps pushing upward. Till such time the helix uncovers the spill port to reduce that pressure which is above the plunger into the spill line. Okay, so your injection is over. Now, remember two things. One is the beginning of injection is fixed. That means if you see the timing diagram, 5 degrees before TDC and 12 degrees after TDC is the injection period. Your 5 degrees is fixed, you cannot change it. But 12 degrees after TDC, it can be changed by rotating the plunger. So it can be made into 10 degrees, it can be made into 9 degrees, it can be made into 13 degrees by simply rotating the plunger. In other words, in this particular pump, we have an arrangement where the beginning of injection is fixed and the end of injection is variable. Okay. This is the most fundamental arrangement. Have you understood what I have said? This is because I am going to, when I explain to you VIT, variable injection timing, where you will have beginning of injection control and of end of injection. Both can be varied. You see, when the engine is running at a certain speed, <coughs> The fuel injection timing is not appropriate at a different speed. At each separate speed, the fuel injection should be different. That is what gives you the best combustion characteristics. You can't have a fixed injection period for any RPM. That's not right. Because the quality of combustion is going to suffer. So you need to vary the injection timing, which means beginning of injection and end of injection. If you see on that diagram, which gives the timing, that gives you the angle for which the fuel is injected. And in the more uh, existing engines, you have an arrangement where you can change the beginning of injection and beginning of and end of injection. All right. Okay. So this is the basic form of a Bosch pump, and you should be able to draw the two diagrams. Either you draw this diagram or you draw this diagram. Any one diagram should suffice when you are explaining the process, how the pump works. What will be the timing of delivery? 
the timing of delivery is the beginning of injection and that is fixed by the cam. You see the cam is going to rotate on the base circle and moment the peak starts to happen or come into play, then you will have the injection beginning. All right. If suppose the cam peak did not have any, okay. Suppose the cam did not have any peak. What will happen? The plunger will not lift. All right. Plunger lifts because the cam has got a peak. And that lifting of the peak will happen when, <coughs> uh, lifting of the plunger will happen when the roller comes on the cam circle peak. Okay. So that is what happens of injecting. It is not that as soon as it comes onto the cam, it will start injecting. No. As soon as it comes onto the cam, you see, then it has to cover this distance from absolute TDC to the point coming up to the uh, suction and spill port. And then when it covers the spill port, the cam is still lifting the plunger up. So as it keeps lifting the plunger up, the injection continues. It continues. The cam is still lifting it up. Even when the spill is taking place, the cam is still lifting the plunger up. So that even in the path of the plunger's movement upwards, the injection has stopped. What would be the timing of Rahul Kumar Patel? Sir, do we have individual rack and governor for each unit of the cylinder? No, no, Rahul. We have fuel pumps whose all the fuel racks are connected to one link. All right. So that when we increase fuel, all the racks are moved simultaneously. And all the racks are again moved simultaneously to reduce the fuel. And this movement is done through a link which is connected to the governor. All right. Now, I am Rahul. I want to know if you have understood it. So I am going to put a question only to you. Now, if I move the rack from starboard side to port side, from starboard side to port side, will I be increasing the fuel or will I be decreasing the fuel? If you look at the diagram and tell me. I am moving the rack from right hand side to the left hand side. That means pushing the rack from the hold position, where the hole is on the rack, I'm pushing it in that direction. Now, will that increase the fuel or decrease the fuel? Rahul? Ah, good. You got it, decreasing the fuel. So I'm feel good that you understood how it works. So, where are the springs fitted? Okay, okay, okay. I am coming to that. You see, this collar at the bottom, this collar at the bottom, it is provided to have a spring carrier. All right. The spring carrier is fitted there and the spring is fitted at this bottom over here. I have not shown it because right now the working is only being explained. So, the spring over here pushes the collar downwards. And the other end of the spring is resting against the housing, pump housing. I have not shown the housing. So one end of the spring is on the housing and one end is on the spring carrier which is fitted here. The spring carrier is basically a disc. <coughs> a basically a disc. And that disc has got a slot. And that slot helps to allow that spring carrier to be fitted straight away. Otherwise, it's not possible to fit a spring carrier because of the collar at that side and another round collar at the bottom. You get the picture. If you have a collar at the top, I will let's make this diagram. Uh, it's pointless looking at me. You might as well look at the diagram what I'm going to show you. Okay, let's put the camera video again. Uh, let's have the sub loop 200. Okay, here you are. Only thing I have to do is set it in the correct direction and that is by doing this job. Video mirror. Oh, again I'll have to do it. Video mirror. Video mirror. Okay. Now, this is, I hope you can see the diagram. So the, this is the plunger and this is the collar. Okay. Lower down the collar you have an arrangement where you have a round collar. This is the round part of the collar. This is the plunger on top. Now you need to fit a spring carrier here. The spring carrier is such 
that it will appear here yeah. and here. And then the spring is resting on this surface. So this is your spring carrier. Now, you tell me out of your intelligence, how will you fit a spring carrier if there is a collar on top and a collar at the bottom? So what they have done, if you see, this is the lower part of the plunger and this is the collar I hope you can see what I'm drawing. So how will you fit a collar inside here? See, what they have, they have a disc like this. And then the, a portion over here is flattened out. This is flattened out. Similarly, on the other side, it is flattened out. So this disc is fitted from the side into that space. So ultimately what you have, you have a spring collar here and this is the spring collar, spring carrier. And this is the collar on which this carrier rests. And on this carrier uh, is the spring that is fitted. So the spring is fitted with the objective of putting the plunger downward. So when the cam peak has been crossed and it comes to the base circle, there has to be some pressure or force which will bring the pump plunger down to the bottommost part. Okay. So the spring is fitted here and I will show you a diagram which I have taken from the net. So that should be able to help you all out. So where are the springs fitted? Okay, that one I was done. Now, before we go further into the technical details, I want you to understand how the fuel is injected and this will be the explanation you will give if asked in an exam, explain how the Bosch fuel pump works and how the fuel is injected. Okay, let's have a look at these four diagrams. When the plunger is at BDC, the fuel enters into the space, fills up the space and some of the oil goes out. This diagram is helpful in explaining how the fuel injection takes place. So the fuel comes in, fills up the space, goes out to the suction port and of course it fills up this annular space also all right this is called the annular space it cannot go past the piston because the clearance between the plunger and the barrel is one micron which means it can only slide between the two okay okay so once it is filled up the plunger starts moving upward once it moves upward it covers the inlet uh, the suction and the spill port okay moment it covers the suction and spill force, the oil on top is trapped. It is under pressure. And the only way it can go is up through a delivery valve and then go to the injector. So the plunger keeps delivering the fuel upward and it keeps delivering as the plunger keeps going up. Till such time, one part of the helix groove comes in line with the bottom part of the suction of the spill port. And you see, I have made a black dot over there. And that dot is indicating that it is just going to open the spill port from this area here. And moment it opens, all the oil will rush out. And in this path, you can see all the oil is rushing out. And in fact, whatever oil is above the piston during its stroke movement upward. Remember, all this time, the plunger is still moving upward. But the fuel has been cut off. It does not mean... As the plunger is going up, the fuel is being injected. No. As the plunger is moving up, the fuel may not be injected because it has not yet covered the ports here. And then when it covers the port, then the effective stroke, then the injection takes place. And then when it opens the suction, uh, the spill port, the plunger is still going upwards. So it goes upward. So your effective stroke is only part of the total stroke. And that effective stroke can be varied by rotating the plunger. In other words, the effective stroke is the distance from the top edge of the plunger to the point on the helix where it uncovers the spill port. Uh, 
uh, what will be your purpose? Ah, Madhav Kumar, you are the one who asked what is the purpose of the helix shape. Now, are, are you able to understand what is the purpose of the helix shape? Madhav? Yes, sir. Okay. That's right. That's it. So, this is the explanation to how the fuel is injected and when it is injected. And I have seen in the past, most boys make a mistake in saying that when the plunger comes to a stop, fuel is injected. No. The plunger keeps moving up, but the fuel has stopped injection. That is because the plunger has the helix port, helix edge opening into the spill port. Plunger is at BDC. This is the first diagram. Fuel fills the chamber also partly exists through the spill port. That is circulation. Okay. Plunger tries to close both the, oh, sorry, plunger rises to close both ports, that means suction and spill port. Fuel trapped and trapped to build hydraulic pressure to open the injector and deliver into the combustion chamber. Helical edge about to open the spill port, that is in the third diagram, I put a spot over there. End of injection, plunger continues to move upwards. Suction and spill ports full open. This is in the last stage when the piston uh, plunger has reached TDC. See, at TDC, there is very little clearance volume over there. So most of the oil has been injected or it has come out from here. Mm. Suction and spill port open, plunger at TDC, plunger part to move downwards. <coughs> so, where does the fuel go through the spill port? To the buffer tank, correct? Rahul, good. We have understood. It goes to the buffer tank. Okay. So right now, we will keep it as this for today. I am not feeling too... Anyway, let's read one more chapter. One more plate. But I want to do this slowly and very, very thoroughly. I don't want to rush the fuel pump chapter very fast. I want each and every one of you to do well in this fuel pump chapter. Understand it, absorb it and be able to explain it. The quantity of fuel delivered is determined by the vertical distance from the top edge of the plunger to the point on the helix which uncovers the spill port and releases the pressure of the entrapped fuel. Okay, I think it's very clean language. The setting to increase or decrease the quantity of fuel delivery may be altered by rotating the plunger. This changes the effective height of the plunger top edge to the helix edge opening point relative to the suction port. I think that is also reasonably understandable. And the last point here is the timing of injection of the fuel is controlled by the relative angular position of the operating cam. And that is the cam I showed you in the diagram with a cam peak. Okay. So that is what determines where is the cam? Okay. Oh yeah. So the cam which is injecting the fuel is actually this one here. This is the cam. Actually, it is not in this shape, it is not so high. It is a little lower than that. And this cam determines the timing. The quantity is determined by the rotary position of the plunger. And the timing is determined by the cam. Okay. When the cam will start lifting. Okay. This can be adjusted by moving the cam relative to the shaft, which is a big job. It is not a small job and we normally don't touch it. The cam, once fixed on the cam shaft, is not to be touched. That is all. Okay. So we have different arrangements to change the beginning of injection and end of injection. And that comes under variable injection timing. So let's see what this plate has 14. Ah, this is to explain to you a little better that uh, how the Bosch pump plunger is. Now I told you earlier that there are some licensee manufacturers who have changed the design a little bit of the barrel and oh, sorry, of the plunger. Now this is one example of changing the design of the plunger. See, the plunger can be like this also. It has got a helix here and end. On the other side also, there is a helix and to, to that end. And there is a hole on top of the plunger 
which goes right through to connect the helix. Okay. Now it is the uh, the principle, the function, everything is the same. Only design of the plunger is slightly different. That's all. This can also be a plunger in place of this. This is the normal plunger, which is very common. This I have noticed in the smaller fuel pumps. They have this sort of an arrangement. I don't know why they have changed it really, because this must be a little difficult to machine in a milling machine. To make this shape must be quite difficult. And I think this to cut a groove is a lot easier to make this groove accurately on both sides of the plunger is definitely a lot easier than machining. But I don't really know. I'm only guessing at why the design changes are there within the two. Okay, we will keep it at this for today, but go through what I have explained to you. Be able to draw the sketches, have the names of the parts of the pump very thoroughly understood. And you should be able to answer any questions up to the point I've given you. Next class, we will go into here is the actual pump what you see. Now, uh, somebody had asked me, so where is the spring fitted? Divakar, here is the spring fitted. You see, there is the spring. It is resting on one end on the spring carrier over here. Can you see the spring carrier? It is in blue. So one end it is sitting in the spring carrier and another end it is sitting on the casing inside here. So this spring carrier helps in keeping the spring in position and lowering the entire plunger downward. So this will be the last diagram I'll show you. I don't want to cause any more confusion. Both the pumps are same with slightly different, you know, design differences. Otherwise, the principle is the same. This is the plunger that you have. This is also the plunger that you have. And you will ask me, sir, what are these two marks on the plunger? These are two marks. You see, the plunger and barrel is moving against each other and there is no lubrication. So how is it going to run? There is lubrication and the fuel oil by itself is a lubricant. And though it scrapes off most of the lubricant, some amount of oil remains on the center. And with improved technology, the clearances are becoming smaller and smaller. So, to retain some lubricant, they have cut a scratch, I will say scratch, a groove on the plunger. And that groove, scratch, is the same as a, you know, as much as an alpin. You know what is an alpin? The diameter of a pin is scratched on the surface of the plunger to retain some oil. So, that oil, when it moves up and down, helps to coat the entire surface of the plunger barrel. But now these pumps are having a lot of trouble because of low sulfur fuels. Moment you have the low sulfur, again, please share PowerPoints of fifth semester MIC topic. We are finished with fifth semester. Pay attention to sixth semester. Now you don't expect me to go back to the previous back, previous semester for all your information. Pay full attention. Other by the time you are in seventh semester, you will ask me about sixth semester. When you are in eighth semester, you ask about seventh semester. Goswami, so, pay attention to class and you will not need to go back into your previous semester. Okay. So, I was telling you how the pump, uh, plunger, and barrel are lubricated. So, a thin groove is cut on the plunger. So, it retains some lubricating oil inside that groove. So, when the barrel and the plunger are working against each other, that small or little amount of oil is adequate for providing the lubrication. But this is also going to be a problem with the low sulfur fuels. The low sulfur fuels have a tendency to lose their, uh, what you call, their lubricity. The lubricity is changed and that because of that lubricity changing, sorry, lubricity changing, you need to have an arrangement to provide for additives and additives are being used in the fuel oil to help provide lubrication. Okay, that is why that explains why the two grooves are there on the plunger here. So we will go into the subject in depth in the later next class. So since the plunger is cam operated, then why we need to have spring, oh no, 
then why we need to have a spring to bring the plunger down? Huh? Rahul, how will the plunger come down? If you push it up, it will remain there. Then what is there to push it down? Nothing. There has to be some means to bring it down. It is like a no force, down or up. Once you remove it and remove the force from the bottom, it remains there. Now, how are you going to bring the plunger down? It's cam operated. The cam is not stuck to the plunger. Cam is only rolling over the plunger. Actually, the cam rolls over the roller. The roller is fitted to a tappet. The tappet is actually part of this. What you see here, this part is the tappet. So the, they have not shown the entire roller over here. There's a roller here. So you must have some means to bring the plunger down. And that is why the spring is there. Sir, in engine 2, 4 stroke and NTPC power plant machine engine, which has better efficiency? This question has got me fucked. In engine 2, 4 stroke and NTPC, National Thermal Power Project, power plant, machine engine, which has better efficiency? Kitij, I am not able to understand your question. Which has Sir, he is asking between two-stroke, four-stroke and an NTPC uh, power machine that is used in the power, thermal power plant. Out of these three, which is which has a higher efficiency? <laughs> Very difficult to say. I cannot give you a direct answer. NTPC power plant is possibly using boilers and steam turbines. That does not come into two-stroke or four-stroke engine. I am pretty sure NTPC does not use diesel engines. They are using steam turbines. And those steam turbines are worked through boilers. And those boilers are fired with oil. We have in our garden reach also Calcutta Electric Supply Corporation, 65 megawatt power plants. And I just was fortunate to go and see them. And they are using boilers and they break the coal into dust and they fire the coal as dust powder and it burns instantaneously and that generates steam from the boiler and that boiler uses the steam to run a turbine the turbine is unbelievably small it will fit into my bedroom it is so small and this turbine is giving 65 kilowatts of course the turbine is fixed to an alternator the alternator produces uh, the power. I'm not sure how you can connect the steam turbine unit with the boiler as compared to your diesel engine. I cannot give you a direct answer to this kind of a question. Sir, use three loaded cam may cause increase in frequency or build up of hydraulic pressure. Now, don't confuse the two. The three lobe cam does not require any injection directly it is only building up pressure for the common rail system so it is better that it has small strokes and multiple strokes so the pressure between the cam and the roller is much less and it is working three times for every rotation and that is for common rail system it is not working a fuel pump but in this case what you see in front of you is a fuel pump for every movement of the cam the pump is expected to deliver fuel in or inject fuel into the fuel injector. Uh, so use three loaded cam may cause increase in frequency of buildup of hydraulic pressure. So it, hydraulic pressure will be the same. Ultimately, we are concerned about the stress in the contact faces between the roller and the cam in the pump. It is enormous. You see, two round surfaces making contact, they are making only at the tangential contact. So the surface area on which the load is acting is very small. And because of this pressure per unit area becomes very high and wear down is very fast. Okay. These are questions which are beyond what is being told to you. But I like the idea that you are asking these questions. Keep it up. I want you to ask more questions. But understand the entire part I have given you today up to this much and we will again repeat next class. Let me go and have a cup of hot tea I need for my throat. Okay. Take care. You have all the questions. I will definitely uh, address them. Okay.
ओके बाय फॉर नाउ थैंक यू सर थैंक यू ओके